can see that. Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, I may do a little bit more extensive review just because Krisha has joined us. And although I can, I can tell by her placid and humble nature, she is a spiritually advanced soul. But um, I'll just try to catch you up. I'm sure you'll follow very quickly, Krisha. So uh, like that, we're, we're covering the five topics of the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita, as you may or may not know, but is uh, an extensive um, book on the topics of spirituality um, coming from the coming from the east, specifically from India, originally in the Sanskrit language, and uh, the Bhagavad Gita really is the source book of all understanding for yoga and meditation, and topics such as karma, reincarnation, like that. So uh, it is explained that there are five primary topics from the Bhagavad Gita, of which we have already covered three of them, and today we'll be uh, covering uh, the fourth, and then next week we'll do the fifth. So um, we are still meeting next week, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next week. Is next week? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> so, uh, so far, uh, and this week, uh, we're going to look at Prakriti which is nature, and we're going to look at the world without and the world within, and the kind of external, how external nature affects us, and how our internal nature also affects the world around us like that. So just a kind of quick recap, of course, we're discussing specifically from the Bhagavad Gita as it is by uh, Swami Prabhupada. And we set the scene initially of the Bhagavad Gita, which is that it's a conversation that takes place on a battlefield of all places. Um, one of the most spiritual conversation takes place in, right at, before the, uh, or at the onset of a very intense war or battle. And we discussed how in this, in this scene, there are two uh, characters Primarily, uh, one is Arjuna, who is a great warrior, and the other is Krishna, who is his dear friend and also his chariot driver. And Krishna or Arjuna becomes very despondent and worried and concerned about having to fight. And in this way, uh, Krishna sort of takes on the role of his guru or teacher, and he begins to instruct him in many different topics. And uh, we discussed about the principle of the search for happiness that we're all going through. We're all more or less looking for happiness in the world. Not too many people that you'll meet who just are looking to be miserable, although some people seem like that's what they find, find most inspiring, uh, either themselves being miserable or making other people. But in general, everyone really wants to be happy. So we discussed the search for happiness and we looked at a principle of who am I? and posing this question of uh, Atato Brahma Jigyasa, uh, which is um, uh, making an inquiry into the absolute and trying to understand who we are. And this was topic one, the soul or Atma. And we looked at the idea of the body being a yantra uh, as given in the Bhagavad Gita or a machine made of the material energy, which is what we're going to discuss more in depth today. And we discussed how the Atma is actually the driver of the machine, or it is the, the spirit or the soul that is inside of the body. And that this is the, the real identity. This is really who we are. But unfortunately, just like Arjuna, sometimes we feel lost and disconnected. And we're also going to discuss this, excuse me, in much more depth today. And in this lost and disconnected state, really in order for us to be uh, happy and content in the search for happiness, we have to reconnect with something higher. And this is the principle of bhakti yoga. Yoga means union. And that reconnection is done through a process of love and devotion. This brought us to the next topic, topic two, which was Ishwara or God. And we looked at the idea of does God exist? And we discussed many different uh, exalted scientists 
and their perspective on the presence and existence of God. <clears throat> because unfortunately, often science is um, claiming that God doesn't exist. So uh, many scientists, most, many of the most profound ones, they do have an acceptance of God. And we looked at this principle of uh, a higher power and trying to find a higher power within ourselves that will help us to uh, conquer over uh, lower, lower natures or influences or things that drag us around and how um, the anonymous groups, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, all these, these different Gamblers Anonymous, they utilize this principle of a higher power and they understand that, again, that there must be a reconnection. And through this reconnection with the higher power, then um, we can actually find some, some peace like that. So last week we discussed um, the principle of karma, which was the third topic. And we talked about what goes around, comes around, and how Isaac Newton also described that for every action there is an equal and opposing reaction. So this principle is also there in science, that what you put out comes back to you. We discussed the topic or idea from the Bible, as you sow, so shall you reap. So whatever seeds of activities or actions you plant out in the world now, those things are going to come back to you. We looked at the idea uh, from the Bhagavad Gita that there are three different types of karma. I'm not sure if everyone remembers, but we discussed about karma, good karma, v karma, bad karma, and a karma, which is means no karma. And the idea of karma or action means that there's a reaction. Good karma means I get a good reaction. Bad karma means I get a bad reaction. And a karma means activities that are in a connected consciousness, which means that there's no good or bad reaction because they're already complete. And we discussed that quite in depth. We also looked at the principle of reincarnation and how the soul is transmigrating from one body to another. Even in this life, we see that that's happening. All of us had a baby's body at one point, then a child's body. Uh, many of you are still young. You're probably around here in this area. Um, for me, I'm kind of getting over to this side here, starting to feel the pains of oh, living in a body for so long. And, you know, so starting to feel like an old man, hair receding, you know, no hair left on my head, you know. So like that, even in this life, we move through bodies, but something about us stays the same. And that is that spiritual spark. And that spiritual spark stays there even through the process of moving into another body. And this is described in the Bhagavad Gita, how the soul transmigrates from one body to another. And even through the different animal species, uh, we looked at that idea or principle of where even Darwin got his um, possible theory for evolution from the, the ancient Vedic texts that describe that there are 8,400,000 species of life, all that exist at the same time. But the actual evolution is not one of physicality, but it's one of consciousness that is connected to the soul. So then we move through different life forms and bodies until we get a human body. And this human, human body is exceptional. It's very special because it enables us to actually really consciously focus on what is the goal and understanding ourselves as a spiritual being and starting to try to act on that platform. So that brings us back to today, <clears throat> um, which we're going to discuss about property or nature. So maybe before we get into it, um, anyone has any questions or comments on what I've just explained or anything that didn't make sense from the previous or that they had left over as um, some residual fallout from our previous uh, conversations? Okay all quiet on the Western front. Okay, so if there aren't any questions, then we'll just carry on. Uh, if I start speaking too fast, uh, which I may have a tendency to do and you can't understand me, please just say, stop, stop, slow down, you're talking too fast. Um, 
All right, so prakriti or nature. So the world within and the world without. So external nature affects, uh, has an effect on us and internal nature has an effect on us. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but question is, do we also agree that the internal nature can dictate or affect the external nature? So can the internal world have an effect on that? So I'd just like for you to take a moment and we'll start with a reflection. Uh, yeah, Krisha, I think probably isn't familiar, but we were doing some journal work with this kind of discussion where we were asking uh, the attendees to do have little reflection moments and write stuff down in their own personal journal or keep you know, somewhere to write down. So I'd like to do a little reflection. So as I mentioned, we can all agree that the external world affects our internal world. Yes, can we all agree on that? Yeah, so if it's raining outside, then you might feel a certain way or have to act a certain way or dress a certain way. It's cold now, you know, it gets dark early. That has an effect on us. When the sun is shining and it's nice and warm, it also has an effect on us. So the external has an effect on our internal. But does the internal have an effect on the external? What do you think? That's a question for you to reflect on. Do you think that the internal can affect the, out, the outside or the external? You know, how, how does the, yeah, so like that. How does your internal world affect the outside world? Maybe things like uh, bad moods, you know, if you're having in a bad mood. Could that cause arguments or upset with others? Or if you're in a good mood, does it create positivity or, you know, energy gives enthusiasm for changes and fatigue causes depression and things like this. <clears throat> yeah, so just make a little note that sometimes if you think it's correct and if so, how, how is it? How have you, you seen that your internal uh, world can affect the outside world or external world? Okay. All right. So we're going to get into this idea of property or nature or matter. So we're going to understand that this is, we're going to be discussing what is the material world. If you remember the picture at the beginning of the five topics, there was a little person and he was in a house. Yeah. And then there were arrows that were moving around. And then there was a, a, a cycle of time going around him. And then there was a little G that was there. So this little person, the house, that's property, that's matter. This is the world that we live in. So if we look around us, we see that there's so much variety, so much variety in the world around us. And actually, it all works in a very mechanistic way, actually. Um, we were just discussing about how it's dark now. So this time of year, that's normal. You know, the sun rises at eight and the sun sets at four. That's, that's just normal for at least where we live and our positioning in accordance with the sun. And in six months time, things will be completely different. But this, these things seem to happen year in and year out. So these things go on like this, uh, rain and sun and uh, the weather and so many things, although they may vary slightly, but there's still a, a mechanical nature to these things. Uh, and it's quite an elaborate system that's set up and functions that if we look at it and we see science and scientists, they spend so much time digging into this matter to try to understand the world around us. And so the, the, this elaborate system is made up of elements and these elements uh, seem to have an effect on us, on us. So we're going to discuss both the material nature and also human nature. So in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, there's a verse in the seventh chapter, text number four, uh, that, it, that it describes the gross material elements. 
And when we say gross, I don't mean like, ooh, gross. I mean, gross, like very tangible or like very more physical because we're going to discuss gross. And another word is called subtle, which means very much more difficult to lay your hands on it or, or experience it with the eyes or the tangible senses. So the Gita describes Bumir upon Alovayur Kamano Buddhiri Vicha. It describes that there is earth, water, fire, air, and ether. And how these elements make up the world around us, and they also make up the physical body. So of course we see earth or land or soil or things around us. But do we understand how earth makes up the body? Is the body made up of earth? Who's the doctors here? We've got some doctors. Is there earth in the body? No. No? Are you a doctor, um, yes? No, <laughs> well, pharmacist. Oh, you're pharmacist. a pharmacist, <laughs> okay. So um, I, as a pharmacist, you should definitely know. What is it often <laughs> when there's a depletion in the body and people aren't healthy, what does the, the doctor or the pharmacist tell people to take? It, when you mean by the uh, earth in the body, can it also be how... Um, the earth provides food and food goes into us. Oh, yeah. We, um, yeah, that can be there for sure. But is the actual physicality of the body, is it made up of, of earth, earthly products? Oh, yeah. In what way? Iron. Flesh and iron, bone. very good. Yes, yeah, okay. iron is in the body for sure. Mm -hmm. Everyone agrees there's iron in the body. Yep. What else? Magnesium. Magnesium is there in the body. Yes, that's what? that's an earthly product. Yes. What else? Calcium. Calcium. The bones are made up of calcium. Yes. So these types of things, niacin or is also there. What others? You know, and what I was trying to say about the pharmacists is they often refer you to take vitamins. Yeah. But what are vitamins? Vitamins are mostly made up of earthly oh elements. yeah plants yeah yeah <laughs> yes like plants. that so yeah. so basically these elements make up the body so first you have earth how about water is there water in the body yes how much 70 percent. 70 percent yeah i always hear different things some say 70 some say 75 some say 80 but it means that the body is predominantly water, at least 70%, which is very hard to believe. If I look at my body, I don't think that there's really water there. But there's so much moisture in the body. The body is 70% liquid. So water makes up the body. So you've got earth, water, mm -hmm. and fire. So is there fire in the body? Like the warmth, uh, the heat? Yeah, every, every body has a temperature, a body temperature, right? And what is, the, what is that temperature normal in Celsius? 30? 37 usually. 36, yeah, 37, 37 is like a standard <laughs> body temperature. So that means that there is something that's generating heat within the body. And where there's heat, there's fire. But my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, you are all the intelligent class of people and I am simply a... Uh, barely graduated high school. So, um, but there's something called mitochondria in the body. Is that correct? And what does mitochondria do? Produce energy. It produces energy, produces heat. Specifically, as far as I've understood, the mitochondria is what, what heats up when there is an infection in the body and it creates fever. And the point of fever within the body usually is to kill or burn up whatever is like kind of bacteria or disease is invading the body. So the, the fever is usually a defense mechanism of the body to help the body be healthy. It's not, we often, we often think, oh, I've got fever, I'm sick, and it's, that's the bad thing, but it's not, it's actually a good thing. And the mitochondria is creating this heat. So there's fire within the body and the temperature can go up and can go down. There's also another place where there's like fire in the body. Where is that? The stomach? Yes, very yeah. good. In the <laughs> stomach, because there are acids in the stomach. And basically what happens is you put food in, even within your mouth, there's saliva is acidic. 
the digestive process starts in the mouth. And then when it gets to the stomach, stomach acids are quite strong. It literally just burns up whatever food you put into it. So there is fire in the body, earth, water, fire. How about air? Is there air in the body? Lungs. Yeah. In the yeah. lungs, yeah. I mean, usually we don't like to talk about air in the body or air coming out of the body. <laughs> but yeah, there's definitely air in the body. So now there's a lot of air in the body. Now the air has escaped the body, but there's definitely air. And if we don't put air in the body, there's also air flowing through our veins, right? The blood is oxygenated. So the oxygen goes into the body and we dispel or exhale um, carbon dioxide. So there's air in the body. And what about ether? What do we think ether? Maybe we don't know what ether is. Ether is That's different from air sound? because ether is what? Is that some like sound sort of vibration or no? No, not exactly. In one sense, yes, but not exactly. Ether is simply space. Mm. Ether is the existence of space. So within a vacuum, you can have space without any air, correct? So like yeah. if you were to go into a vault, sometimes in vaults, they take the air out and it's created just there's a space there, but there's not really the existence of so much air. Or if you go into outer space, supposedly there's not really air that we can breathe. There's an absence of, of air meaning the like hydrogen or, or sorry, oxygen or carbon dioxide or these types of things. So is there ether in the body? Is there space within the body? Yes, of course. And in fact, it's described even within every atom of matter, there's more space within an atom than there is the actual physical structure. So again, something that's very difficult to see. Now, if you look at these elements, you'll see that earth is something very tangible. You know, you can take mud and rocks and stones and trees and things like that. It's very tangible. Uh, water uh, is also tangible, but it's becoming a little bit fluid. It's like more liquid. It's hard to hold on to. Earth, water, fire. Fire is almost like air. It's not something you can really grab onto, but it's something you can still experience as an element but it's not really something, it's like air. If you've ever sat and watched a flame or fire, it's like, it's not really, yeah, it's not really a solid thing. And then air, of course, is almost invisible. We can hardly see it, but we know it exists because we're breathing, for one, or you can see the air blowing in the trees. So it's a very subtle, it's a more subtle of the gross elements. And then ether is basically, it just exists and you're not even aware of it all the time. So these are the five main building blocks of the material energy according to the Bhagavad Gita and also backed up by science. Now, what are the subtle elements? So these subtle elements are described as just like ether is impossible to see, but you understand it exists. Just like I'm in a room now and I can see that there's space, but you don't you can't grab it and put it in a jar or something like that. So these subtle elements are called the mind, the intelligence, and the false ego. And this means that there's the mind. Now you may say, what is the mind? Well, the mind is that little voice that's probably been saying, what is this guy going on about? He's talking about all these things. And why is he talking about that? And I've got better things I could do with my time. And what time is he going to finish? Because I'm hungry. And oh, I was late. Or why did I turn on my camera? Or, why is Vrishni's camera always on? You know, <laughs> all of these things, whatever your mind, that's your mind. Da, 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 da. And many times people have lots of problems with the mind because the mind Mind will not be quiet. It keeps talking all the time, which is why we do at the end a little mantra meditation. And mana means the mind and tra means to free. So it means to help free ourselves from the exhaustion of that mind that is always talking. Then there's the intelligence. And it's described that the intelligence is more subtle than the mind because the intelligence is kind of like the data bank of information or knowledge that one has. You can't see it, it's not tangible. You can't pull the SD card out of my head or there's not a chip where you can say, oh, this is how smart he is. 
but intelligence is visible when one speaks or when one acts, but it's there. So if you look at an object, you can only understand or interpret what that object is according to the level of intelligence that you have. People who have cultivated a certain level of intelligence with, let's say, fixing car engines or performing uh, surgery, brain surgery. You know, you could say both a, a car mechanic and a brain surgeon are both good with their hands, but you wouldn't want a mechanic to do brain surgery on you. You want someone who has a different level of intelligence and you probably wouldn't want a brain surgeon to come and fix your car. So it's about intelligence. So that intelligence is a subtle thing that's stored. And then there's the idea of false ego. And I'll explain a little bit later why we call it false ego, but ego, it means id, it means my identity. And what is that identity? That identity is the culmination of all of these things, my physical body, my mind, my intelligence, and that's who I declare myself to be. So I am a white, middle-aged American man um, who lives in London, and that's how I describe myself. And we talked a lot about this in the Who Am I section. So this is the identity, and we call it the false ego because as we discussed before, we identify with these externals and that's a false identification because we forget that actually who we really are is that spiritual spark that's inside of this external identity. So I hope this isn't too complicated. I hope it makes a little bit of sense, but this is a big topic that's discussed in the Bhagavad Gita. Now, as we move on and look at the idea of nature, Prakriti, uh, or we often refer to nature as mother, mother nature. Um, in the West, nature is referred to in a feminine uh, perspective as mother nature. And in the East, they refer to mother nature or mother earth as Bhumi Devi. So there's all, almost always a feminine acknowledgement of, the, of, of nature. So like that, and we may ask, well, why is that that it comes? Well, because mother gives birth, mother gives life, and she also uh, sustains life. So in this way, the material energy has a feminine nature, a feminine potency to it, because it actually gives life and sustains life. And the Bhagavad Gita explains these many principles of the building blocks of nature. So we're gonna look a little bit now of how nature relates to some of the previous topics that we've discussed. So previously we, we discussed an idea which we didn't use this term Purusha, we used the term Ishwara. So we have this term Ishwara which is God, but Purusha is the same. And then you have Prakriti. So you have this idea of the masculine and feminine energies. And that's very much present within the ideals of Krishna consciousness, where we understand that there is a kind of a supreme masculine and a supreme feminine. So it's not that either one is right or wrong, good or bad, better than the other. They're both required for full functionality within life. And we see that life only comes when these two forces come together and give birth to um, the little, uh, little jiva. That's the Atma, that's the soul. So by the combination of the spiritual energy and the combination of the material energy, the soul or the Atma comes into being. And this is a little spark, a tiny spark of God's splendor. So the little Jivas or the little Atmas, that's us, by the way, and, and all, of, all of us here, we're little Jivas. The thing is that because we're originally... Um, spiritual by nature, by our, 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 our uh, original nature, then we're also little Purushas. We're kind of like little, little gods or little controllers. And in this way, we like to try to enjoy everything because that's, and we like to try to control everything and we like to try to manipulate things so that we get what we want the way that we want it. And that becomes a problem because we try to do that in the material energy or in the material world. And we forget our divinity uh, and, and, uh, and its connectedness to the divine. And in that way, we just get caught up in a network 
of the material energy. And in this way, the material energy kind of starts to bind us or tie us in, just like uh, if a, a fly lands in the web of a spider and it starts to, it, once it gets stuck, it tries to escape, but the more that it tries to escape, the more that it just gets entangled in the complexities of the web. So the material energy is very powerful in the sense that us as little, little uh, souls, little atmas or connected little sparks of the splendor of God, we come into the material nature and we get bound up. And this idea of getting bound is really, really an important concept for understanding the material nature, because there is something called the gunas, and specifically the three gunas, um, which are like rope, and they kind of tie us. So prakriti is comprised of these three gunas. Uh, we also call them modes uh, or modes of nature, modes being like on a fan or many items you have three modes, low, medium, and high. So in the material world, we have three modes. We have ignorance, passion, and goodness. So like that. So these uh, modes are, or gunas are also described like the three primary colors of a color wheel and yellow, red, and blue. So the yellow, red, and blue from those three come so much variety depending on how they mix. So this is the way that the gunas or the ropes of the material energy work. So it's described that the whole color palette comes from these three primary colors. And then we get the secondary colors. And the more that we mix them, we get all the other colors. So um, on this color chart, we can see that uh, there's diversity between each section of the colors. And similarly, within human society, these three gunas create a range of individuals um, and different bodies and forms, um, species. So many different things are created from these three gunas. So a quick reflection. Where do, because Actually, let me, because these, these three gunas, um, usually the color yellow is connected with goodness. So if you see this color band here, this is kind of considered goodness. Then it starts to go to blue and blue is usually considered uh, ignorance. It's more of a darker color. And this color over here, the reds, they're usually considered like passion. So you have kind of goodness, you have ignorance and you have passion. And it's described that for many of us, we may be fluctuating between them. And we're going to discuss this more in depth in a minute. So a little reflection, where do you think you fit into the color wheel? What do you, what do you most uh, identify with on the color wheel here? Are you a purple? Are you a yellow? Maybe you're a pink. Maybe you're green. Maybe you feel blue. Which one is it? Where do you, how do you feel? You know, you can see I'm, I'm in blue. I'm very much in, in blue. <laughs> so like that. So just write it down quickly, whichever one, because uh, unfortunately I'm talking too much and we're running out of time. So like that. Okay, so these three, these three modes of material nature or these three gunas, um, it's described that that little jiva or the atma is kind of entrapped in successive temporary bodies within the property. And these, these three modes are kind of controlling us, just like we have here in this thing. You have the yellow, the blue, and the red, and they're kind of just pulling us around and acting in so many different ways. And within the three modes, there's creation, there's sustenance, and then there's destruction. So everything in this world goes through these types of phases. It comes into being, it stays for some time, and then it diminishes. That is the nature of the material world. Everything, we get something new. You know, some, someone just was talking to me that they just got a new phone, an iPhone, whatever it is, 22 or something. <laughs> and they're like, I've got it. And I was thinking, yeah, it's also new and pristine now. But in one year's time, I would like to see the condition of that phone. 
because it's going to diminish. It'll stay for some time. But then after two or three years, you start to feel like the phone's useless. It doesn't work so fast. It's filled up with stuff. And then it winds up in the bin and it gets crushed up and made into a new iPhone by somebody else. So this is the nature of the material world. If we understand the gunas, they can be a very, very powerful tool for helping us to gain control over the mind, the body and our emotions and really helping us to have a transformation in our life. And that's what I really want to try to focus on today, how this gunas and we can kind of do guna management. So let's look at it again. These are three gunas. There's sattva, which is goodness, rajas, which is passion, and tamas, which is ignorance. And we're going to look at some of the symptoms. So tamas first is considered the mode of ignorance. Now, it's we mentioned earlier, it's kind of in the blue category. And so these are some of the characteristics of the mode of ignorance. Um, madness, laziness, sleep, foolishness, anger, violence, hatred, envy, revenge. I think you kind of get the idea. <laughs> And I'm sure most all of you who seem to be such saintly, pure hearted, kind, loving souls are never influenced by this. But maybe every now and again, you get angry or maybe every now and again, you just feel lazy, you know. So like this, this is the kind of mode. So a person in this mode is basically usually pursuing some sort of pleasure in the world, but often is very reluctant to any idea of commitment. So that's something we'll discuss a little bit later. Rajas, passion. Woo, passion. How will we describe passion? Yes, passion means I, I'm kind of greedy for things. I want things. I'm, I have an agitated mind and senses. I, I've got lots of desires and longings. I want lots of things. I love this. I want that. And intensely driven also to fulfill those desires and oftentimes there's kind of an idea of gain and then a kind of I, me, and my consciousness. So this is Rajas. And again, I doubt if any of you are influenced by, by this mode at all, you know, the go, 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 go. Um, unfortunately, coming from America, my whole life is all about go, go, go. You know, that's the nature that we're kind of brought up with. You have to succeed. You have to win. You have to be the best. That's a very passionate nature. And this is often symptomized by pursuance of pleasure and, and you're committed to that, getting that pleasure. And that commitment is often shown by striving for material benefit for one's own self and for those directly around me. So that's kind of a passionate, passionate inclination. Then we have sattva, which is goodness. And some of the characteristics are purity. We like things that are, that are more pure and, and clean, uh, happy, inner satisfaction, uh, a sense of duty or selflessness, uh, humility, cleanliness, there's compassion, a search for spiritual knowledge or higher understanding. These are symptoms of the mode of goodness or sattva guna. And it's described that what happens the way that one comes to the platform of sattva is that one becomes frustrated with just getting the rewards of hard work. And one actually starts looking for more refined ways, more subtle ways to become happy in this world. Instead of just chasing after things and getting them, one actually realizes there's a, there's a, a better way to enjoy. So in brief, you have sattva, rajas, and tamas. So here they are. So now you can look back at your reflection of which one of those colors you kind of connected with and see, are you the kind of Buddha guy there? Or are you the guy going, ah! <laughs> are you, are you, uh, is that Homer, Homer Simpson? <laughs> so few of us in the West have ever heard of the term guna, but this concept of gunas is a really powerful tool for helping us to first understand how we're being influenced. So let's look at this. Tamas, 
Here's Thomas. How often does your alarm clock go off in the morning and you have to drag yourself out of bed, bleary-eyed and sluggish and desperate? Oh, you know, just desperately like, oh, what is it most people get up and they're like, I just need a cup of coffee. And if I have a cup of coffee, then Rajas, woohoo! Now I feel awake. Yes. So actually, we're naturally managing the modes anyway. We're doing this naturally. We're, we know that I'm sleepy and tired and inert. So now let me stick something into my body so that woo, I feel energy in life. And that's now we're in Rajas. We're ready to go and do whatever. Even if I don't have anything to do, I've got plenty of energy to do nothing. Woohoo! So that's it. So the moment we reach for the coffee pot, we're unconsciously trying to manage our mode. So Rajas is the mode of action, movement, and activity. Then what often happens is you get uh, like this, and then the next thing you go through the Rajas Tama cycle. So you get fired up with 50 cups of coffee so you can go rah, rah, rah all day at university, all day at work. And then in the evening, you're like, ah, and you just completely crash out. So you work hard and you sleep hard. And then you live for the weekend, right? Where you can just sleep in and you don't have to get up and fight through the day. This is the Rajas Thomas cycle, okay? So all of us are probably experiencing this in one way or another. But what we're really, what we should be striving for is something a little more sattvic, something that is a little more mode of goodness where we actually, when we wake up in the morning, we don't feel like we need to go and fill ourselves with some, um, you know, caffeine so that we can get started. But maybe there's another way that we can wake up and elevate ourselves so that we still use rajas, but we're actually using rajas instead of being used by rajas, if that makes sense. So we start to manage the, mode, the modes so that they're beneficial for us. And that means we have to utilize our intelligence. And intelligence is a symptom of goodness. It means we're conscious of the way the modes are working. We're conscious of how to manipulate the modes so that they can help us to traverse the challenges of the day and of the world and of our life but in a way that's going to be beneficial for our forward progress, hypothetically and hopefully spiritually like that. So these are ideas of guna management that we don't want to be a victim of the gunas. So therefore, we have to take responsibility and find balance in these gunas. So just a little reflection or a little <clears throat> um, review. So there's there's a fourth mode, which is a spiritual mode. So you have the mode of ignorance, and then you have the mode of passion, and you have the mode of goodness, and then ultimately you have transcendence. So the idea is that there are these three modes, but if we cultivate spiritual consciousness through the mode of goodness, ultimately we can transcend all of these three modes and we can achieve what is known as a spiritual mode where we no longer function or act on the material mode uh, in the material nature, but we function and act according to our inner nature, our ultimate original ego, which is the spiritual identity. And that is transcendental to all of these modes. And this is what has basically happened with Arjuna. So Arjuna is uh, really wanting to understand his true nature. And much of the dialogue in the Bhagavad Gita is about understanding our nature. Through Arjuna, who has understood that he has a certain nature, but now he doesn't want to act according to his nature. As we, we discuss this challenging situation, and some of us also come up against this, that we know we should be doing a certain thing, but somehow we're drawn and forced to act in a different way, even though we know better, even though something inside of us is telling us that we shouldn't have that fourth cookie or eat that cho next chocolate bar, or we shouldn't buy those shoes or that bag, 
or we shouldn't buy another iPhone because I'm going to max out my credit card, or we shouldn't like lay in bed for another four hours because I'm going to be late for my assignment or late for school. You know, we know that we shouldn't do certain things, but still we do it. So what is it that's pulling us to do that? It's the gunas. And we have to learn how to interact with these gunas so that we can actually make spiritual progress and overcome them. So some quick journal work, if you get out your journal. So there are, let's say, seven main areas of influence that we often would like to have breakthroughs in life, many people discuss. And that's the area of diet. Many, many people in the world struggle with diet. Eating too much, eating too little, eating the wrong things. Lifestyle, that can be, you know, how we, um, how we interact uh, uh, in the world. What, what is, you know, is it too much work? Is it too much play? Is it like this? There's the idea of work. So some people, they work too much. Some people, they work too little. <laughs> some people, they don't work at all. And like that. so, you know, what, what is our work? And is that work inspiring and enlivening to me? Our environment, look around you right now. What is your environment? What mode is your environment in? I mean, you might say it's in the mode of ignorance because it's a complete mess. Like, you know, my socks are over here and my towel from this morning is over there. And, you know, I got food from three days ago, growing fungus and a science experiment sitting on my desk or something, you know, or is it that it's in the mode of passion where it's a little kind of tidy, but there's stacks of papers and things that need to be done and post-it notes all over everything. Or is it in goodness because it's very clean, it's nicely dusted, it's, it's very satin. What is the environment that you're in? Media exposure, how much media am I getting overwhelmed by day in and day out, you know? And what kind of media am I watching? What's going into my consciousness? Am I looking at things that are in tamas, rajas, or sattva? How am I exposing myself? Leisure time. What do you do in your leisure time? Is your leisure time like, ah, you know, just do nothing? Or is leisure time like, go, 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 go? Or is leisure time kind of more peaceful and time to relax? And, and then other people. What is your association? Is your association like with people who are more influenced by the lower modes, goodness or, or ignorance, passion or goodness? And how does that affect you? Do you find that with, when you're with certain people that it has a very adverse effect on you? If so, you know, how can you affect the change in that area? So the idea is that we want to set a goal. Uh, that over the next sort of um, week, you can try to have a transformational change by managing the gunas, by having a little bit of knowledge and understanding and really try to do something. So which one of these areas would you like to have a transformation in over the next week? Okay, so just choose one of those areas that you think, yeah, I really want to watch my diet over the next week, or I want to get a control on my media exposure. I'm looking at Facebook 13 hours a day, and most of what I'm looking at is of no relevance. Or is it leisure time that I just veg out all the time? And what is it? You choose one. Okay. And then uh, we want you to set a goal. And of course, all of you are probably familiar with this idea of SMART goals. So SMART, a SMART goal means it's specific it's measurable, it's achievable, it's realistic, and it's time bound. So if you can go ahead now and just set a quick goal of something that you'd like to see. So what might that look like a SMART goal? So let me see, um, so work. Uh, let's say if work, if you're finding that you're working, you bring your work home and you find yourself you know, between the hours of eight and nine or eight and 10, you're still doing loads of work from the day and you get stressed out. And then when you go to sleep, you can't sleep. That's having an adverse effect on you. Okay, so what's, what is the mode that's affecting me? I think I'm in the mode of passion when I should be winding down to go to sleep and I should be inciting the mode of ignorance. So I should be relaxing myself. 
okay, so what can I do? Okay, so let me just stop that. I don't want to be doing work between 8 and 10. So my goal is for the next week, between the hours and 8 and 10, I will not do work. Okay, that's great. What will I do? Um, I'm going to have a cup of relaxation tea. Um, and I'm not going to have any caffeine before I go to sleep. I'm just going to have some nice calming herbal tea and I'm going to read uh, something that's relaxing and I'm going to just mellow out and try to have a good night's sleep because then that will help me to be more productive the next day. Okay, that's great. Sounds like a good goal. Um, so something like that. So be smart. You're all very smart anyway, like that. So just set a goal. It's just something to try. That way, if we learn something and we put it into action, it's going to have much more of a profound effect on us over the next day. So knowledge put into action is much more effective and stays with us for longer. Okay, next week, we're going to discuss the last topic, which is Kala or time, and we call this the priceless commodity. So we're gonna discuss time, and we're leading up to that by talking about how we're gonna utilize our time and how to best manage our time through the modes, okay? So if anyone has any questions or reflections, I sped through that last part quite a bit, so I could finish at 7.30. Um, so I'm sure there was a lot of information, a lot more conversation we could have, but if anyone has any questions or comments or thoughts or reflections, please, you can give those now. Can, can I go first? Okay, Vishal. Yes. Um, so there was a point you made earlier about, um, how, say you have an alarm clock and the more times you turn it off and, uh, I see myself doing this every day where mm -hmm. it's like, I want to wake up and get work done or like if I'm um, behind on something, but it's where um, I'm turning off the alarm six, seven times before I actually get up. Yeah. And it was quite interesting to think that it would come under the, the part of ignorance and how it's um, to do with that. Mm -hmm. And also, um, what was this point? also, I heard this other point where they were talking, uh, it was in a different talk where they were saying how, um, during different parts of the day, different um, these gunas, yeah, they, they um, what do you call it? They work preside over parts they, of the they, day. They're more prominent in certain times of the day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Nice point uh, about the alarm clock. If you think about it, just even using the words, the alarm is going off because you want to get up. Yes. Yeah. And when you turn the alarm off, what are you doing? You are ignoring the alarm. Mm. You're ignoring, you set the alarm, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> I, I did, mean, yeah. You set the blinking alarm. So you set it, and basically what you're doing is you're ignoring the kind of higher, your, in a sense, your higher self or a higher consciousness to yeah. get up and be functional at that time. Yeah. Now... The thing is that you mentioned in the second reflection was that different parts of the day are influenced more predominantly by different gunas. The morning hours from just before sunrise until around 9, 10 on the color wheel is kind of the, uh, the yellow, you know? The sun is coming up and it's, it's very nice, peaceful time. Being awake at like, the morning hours, four, five, six, it's very conducive to the mode of goodness. But once it starts to get to 10, 11, 12, sun is at the highest point in the sky at the midday. That means the heat, the passion is flowing and you see everyone is out. <clears throat> Everyone's moving and they keep going until around the five, six o'clock, um, kind of thing in the evening up until maybe around eight when the sun is finally set and diminished. And then at that time, it starts to get dark. And with darkness comes Thomas and comes ignorance. And then mostly the evening hours are influenced by those lower modes like that, the mode of ignorance. So if you, if you, you know, often you find people trying to study Students are mostly studying through the night, and it's kind of like an uphill battle. 
the uphill battle because you're desperately trying to study at a time that's actually not conducive to study. You should be sleeping at night and waking up early and studying in the peaceful hours of the morning. Yeah. But I know so many students, they do, no, I did an all-nighter. It's like, yeah, you wasted eight hours, in my opinion, because you could have studied and retained so much more if you had had a good night's sleep and you had actually gotten up early and utilized those vital morning hours where everything is very fresh. Because at the end of the day, who is fresh at the end of the day? Nobody's fresh after like being awake for 12 or 13 hours. It's, you know, most people are run down. So you run on a different kind of energy in the evening. That's why many people find the evening hours are very creative, um, you know, because there's a different energy there. But the morning hours are actually the best hours, the best hours. So anyway, that's just a little re-reflection on your reflection. Right. Thanks. But thank you for that. Very, very important points. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? Hello. Yes, I would just like to uh, make sure I understood the question. Was it about how we would change change our scheduling or our habits? Yeah, very nice. So um, with this, the idea was to choose one of the areas that I had mentioned. You can choose another one uh, in which over the next week you would like to have a transformation. The likelihood is that all of us feel that there's an area of our life that we could improve. With the knowledge of the gunas, we may have an insight into the way that the material world and the material energy is pulling us to act in a way that we'd really rather not act. The main way to gain access into having a transformation in an area where we're not happy with our lives or with ourselves is first we have to understand and have knowledge about it. With knowledge comes power and strength. So if we have knowledge, then that knowledge makes our intelligence strong, which means that it can help to uh, change things. So first we have to have the inspiration to have the change. Then when we set a goal and we start to act on that, just like um, Vishal was saying, getting up. Okay, so to, for this week, when the alarm goes off, be committed to just get up. That's it. That's a simple goal. For the next week, when my alarm goes off, I am not going to hit the snooze button. The first day, you're going to hit the snooze button. The second day, you'll probably still hit the snooze button. But let's say he says he hits the snooze button five times. So maybe he'll hit it three. Second day, he may hit it one. And on the third day, he's going to say, no, I said I was going to do this, and he doesn't hit it. And as soon as you don't hit the snooze button and you get up the first time, you're going to have an experience of, of some power in your life where you're managing the gunas and not being controlled by them. I don't know if that makes any sense, but then what will need to happen is you need to keep doing that for some time and then you create a habit. And by the creation of that habit that's in a mode of goodness, you will find a lot of, of, of strength and enthusiasm and, and energy that comes from doing that. So that's the idea. I don't know if that makes sense, Krisha, or if I've just confused you more. Oh, no. <laughs> No, I have definitely a lot to think about. I will, I will watch the recording and apply what I've learned throughout okay. the next week. All right, wonderful. Thank you. That's wonderful. Anyone else? Marcello, Fernanda. Oh, there you are. Hello, Fernanda. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Hi, nice to see you too. Yeah. You have an amazing backdrop. That's you are you are kind of uh, pinky purple. It's kind of like. Yeah, you're a goodness, passion kind of person. I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> Although I'm very lazy sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, yeah, but no questions today. Thank you. It was great as always. Okay. Did it make sense? Yes, a lot, actually. Could we, I mean, yeah, Avisha was saying, because it depends on the day where we are, right? So I think the idea would be just having some 
uh, consistent then trying to keep ourselves consistent yeah okay yeah regulation makes a big difference in our life although i know when when i was young i didn't want to be regulated about anything i just wanted to do whatever i wanted to do whenever i wanted to do it however i wanted to do it <laughs> but later i found that by being regulated it actually helps a lot of things um, and things go much, much smoother and life just flows a little bit easier. And it actually allows more time, which we'll discuss more next week. Um, we find that the more regulated we are, the more time we actually wind up having. We can be much more effective. But if we just let, you know, if we're just like free spirits, sometimes we think we have a lot of time, but actually a lot of time winds up getting wasted because of the, the lower modes, especially the mode of ignorance, because we ignore a lot of important things in order to try to be passionate and enjoy and have fun. And then we keep winding up in that cycle of Rajas yeah. and Thomas like that. So, so we enjoy and suffer, exactly. suffer and enjoy, you know, and it's like, it goes like that instead of finding a sort of even keel or even pace like that. Okay. okay. Uh, does that make a little bit of sense? Yes, a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I hope I'm not like, am I overwhelming everyone with all this information or is it, no, is it absolutely. okay? No? It's okay. okay. Marcella, you're still awake? Okay. You're on mute. <laughs> you don't need to. Okay. I can like, hear her. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are in the same room. You're in the same house? The same house, yeah, but she's in the next room. Oh, you're like Varsha and Vrishy, right? <laughs> yes. It's like you live in the same house, but you need some space. You know? need, yeah. Our individuality. You know? That's right. That can never be lost. I agree. <laughs> But mm. well, Jai, is there an explanation why we humans are so lazy? Um, <laughs> because I, I feel like everyone is a little bit. Of well, like, yeah, I don't know. No, this is important to understand. It's not, you know, there's a time to be lazy. It's not that any of the modes are necessarily bad. It's just if they predominate our life in an adverse way, then we have to deal with that adversity. So if, you know, like I was saying earlier, if you, if you pull an all-nighter, right, trying to cram, 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 you're combining the mode of ignorance and the mode of passion, and you're hoping to get some good result. Yeah. But very often it doesn't, it doesn't come. But why not, like, push yourself from the early hours until the evening and then become lazy at night when you should feel lazy and go to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make sense? And then get you know, whatever the hours of rest that you need, get them. Or if you find yourself in the middle of the day um, quite wiped out for whatever reason, maybe it's been a very intense day, then you might need to have what sometimes they call a snap. You know, it's, so it's like a, it's kind of a, a quick nap. And um, someone once taught me that, you know, when I used to work in the city, that sometimes they'd be like, oh God, this is like too much. And you just think I'm so tired, I can't go on. So they say, if you put your, if you have a bunch of keys, you put them in your hand and you rest it in your lap. And then, uh, and then you kind of just put your head down Take a deep breath and just basically allow yourself to kind of doze off. And as you doze off, your hand will relax. And when it fully relaxes, the keys will fall out. They'll hit the floor. They'll wake you up. But you'll, you'll have reset your system almost. It's an interesting trick. Interesting. You should yeah. try it because it does work. Basically, you allow your body to relax enough to the point where it goes to sleep. But then it just wakes up. And it's sometimes just enough to make you feel like, oh yeah, I had, I had a, enough sleep. Actually, the surprising thing is that most of the, some of, some of, or most of the most productive people in the world, um, they don't sleep very much. They get just enough sleep to keep them going. So there's a whole talk we could give on, on the cycles of sleep.
and how when we sleep, our, our consciousness goes through these cycles. And most people go through two, two slight cycles in a night, which usually comes up to be around six hours. But if you wake up in the middle of a cycle, that's when you feel like, uh, mm -hmm. like if you've ever fallen asleep in the daytime and someone wakes you up and you spend like the next hour like wandering around like a zombie, it's because you went into deep sleep and then someone pulled you out of it and you don't ever really feel like you came out of that deep sleep. But if you find out what your sleep cycle pattern is, you could just have one sleep cycle and you get enough deep sleep, REM sleep, and then light sleep. And you just have that. And that could be inside of three hours. And you could do that and you could actually function. And many people do function, not many. Actually, most people don't function on three hours of sleep. But, but some of the brightest and most constructive or creative people, they, they can function on that because they've learned that cycle. But some people are like, I need eight or 10 hours of sleep. It's like, nobody needs eight or 10 hours of sleep. <laughs> it's just not a reality. But once you get into the third cycle, you've almost got to go for the full three hours. So then you're pushing the eight to nine hour mark. So anyway, there's a lot of things that could be said around that. But laziness often comes from burnout from the mode of passion. So we push, 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 push. And then we feel like I deserve a break. I've worked so hard. I'm just going to sit on the sofa and eat donuts and watch TV <laughs> until, you know, I fall asleep here in my, you know, pajamas or whatever. And like, I don't care. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So because we've gone, gone, gone in the mode of passion, we feel like now I deserve a break, you know? And that's kind of where laziness comes in. Or you get what is an illness, which is that people push themselves so hard for so much of their life that then their body basically breaks down and they just, they just feel exhausted all the time. They've run themselves down. They've just you know, spoiled so much of the energy by pushing, pushing, pushing. And see, society is, is more or less pushing us to push ourselves harder and harder and harder all the time. But intelligent people know that things have to be done at a pace. And if they push too hard, something breaks. And that's what happens. Either some part of the mind breaks for people and they become depressed or they start to lose it and go a little crazy, or people, the body breaks, and then they just don't have energy, they burn themselves out in different ways. So like this, it's best that early on in life, we understand this, this knowledge, and we start to try and find a nice balance, where when I need to be go, 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 I can go, go, but I know I need to wind down in the evening, or I know I need to start in the morning also on an even keel and put goodness at the beginning and also goodness at the end and try to moderate and regulate my life in, in a way that's going to keep me peaceful. And you'll find around you, people will be like, no, you need to go, you need to go. And you'll be like, I don't need to do anything. Don't worry. Little drops will wear away the stone. I can also get more done over time and you push, 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 and often people don't really get so much out of that anyway. And when we're around people that feel like, oh, you know, I need to just be lazy, but you'll feel like, no, I've got energy. Why would I want to be lazy now? Let me do something that's constructive and useful. So <clears throat> anyway, these are just, it's a huge topic, a huge topic. But if we understand it first, that's what I was saying to Krisha, if we have some knowledge about it, then we can see it. We start to see it in the world around us. Oh my God, I'm in the mode of, of ignorance right now. Do I want to be in this mode? Is this a good time to be in the mode of ignorance? No, it's not. Let me make a change. That's consciousness. And with that consciousness, we utilize our intelligence and we have a transformation. And then we're like, that is really good. Hey, I actually have some power and control in my life again. Mm -hmm. So like that. Not in a negative way, but in a positive way. So anyway, I'm rambling on. I'm very passionate now about this topic. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, that's okay. <clears throat> yeah, yeah I like the the um the color wheel. Like I've never seen that representation before of 
of the moods and I like for me I tend to find that I kind of flip-flop between all of them like throughout like the day so yeah kind of like Michelle was saying okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean we all go through it that's in the Bhagavad Gita it describes that these three modes they themselves are fighting for prominence over us so that's why we have to have that inner strength to be able to to deal with the onslaught and sometimes the things that the world throws at us we don't expect we just we we weren't prepared for it but if if we've cultivated goodness when adversity comes we're not shaken so much but if we're already on shaky ground when something comes it's like what they say the straw that breaks the camel's back and then it's like, I'm already on the edge. I've been up all night. I've been on. And then someone tells you that, you know, I don't know, your best friend has passed away or your someone you know has cancer or, or that you've got cancer. And then your whole life just falls apart, you know, because you're not in a conscious space where you can deal with it. But if, you, if you've cultivated goodness in your life and something adversity comes in, you're not so shaken because you're already stable. You're already steady. And then you can handle many, many more difficult circumstances and situations without being so, so um, moved or shaken by them. If that makes a little bit of sense. 